Hi, Roger. How are you? I'm, I'm doing well, except for some allergies, and I hope we can work through this, George. So thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. I really appreciate it. On behalf of all the viewers, all the 20 million uh, learning and the development professionals, I thank you to be here. Thank, thank you for the honor of inviting me. Uh, uh, this is a very good opportunity for us, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kaufman. You have, been, uh, you have been devoting yourself to this field for such a long time. And to hear your name and talking to you is uh, one of the honors to all of us. And uh, uh, during this one hour, uh, one hour interview, I have a lot of questions to ask you. And uh, let's start from the very beginning. Where is the hometown? Where did you, did you grow up? And where did you go to college? And what's your major? Can you tell, tell us a little bit about that? Well, I was born at a very early age. And uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, I grew up there, uh, mm -hmm. graduated Wilson, Woodrow Wilson High School, uh, went to uh, George Washington University, where I got my bachelor's degree in uh, applied psychology, sociology, and statistics. And then I went to John, Johns Hopkins, where I got my master's degree. And from there, I went to University of California, Berkeley, where I had the honor of working with some great faculty, including Edward Tolman the Gestalt psychologist. And uh, from there, I uh, uh, had two kids and no money and uh, left before I get my PhD, went to work at uh, Boeing Aircraft, a one-man human factors group on the Bomark uh, missile, uh, moved to Martin Baltimore, uh, where I got interested in the uh, programmed instruction business mm -hmm. uh, with, a, uh, with my boss, whose name was Tom Erline. And together we conspired to send a very expensive telegram uh, to uh, U.S. Industries, uh, which was had a blind ad for uh, people in the field. Uh, Tom got the job, brought me along, uh, and uh, that's where I started working on branching program in the Auto Tutor, which was Norm Crowder's uh, invention. I uh, was lucky enough to uh, uh, meet. Uh, some people, uh, Joe Tucker, who was a mentor to me and helped me to find my uh, dissertation topic, which I finished at uh, uh, New York University because it was in New York at the time. Uh, got there. One of the people working there was a fellow by the name of Peter Pipe. And uh, Peter not only was competent, he was a nice man. I mean, he was a good man. And uh, met some other people along the way and managed to meet uh, the woman who would be my wife, Jan, uh, Karen, she's now Jan Kaufman, and uh, got really involved in the uh, program of instruction and then found out that uh, program of instruction was just part of a solution and I kept on uh, expanding my view. Uh, it was there that uh, one day I had moved from uh, U.S. Industries to uh, Bolt, Baranek & Newman, which was the largest acoustical consulting firm in the world, and also uh, w worked tangentially on a little project called the Internet, which was embedded there. Uh, and uh, the, uh, one day I was sitting in my office and uh, I got a call from Gabriel D. Ofi, who was a full colonel in the United States Air Force. And he said, Roger, uh, you are helping start the National Society for Programmed Instruction, which was Gabe's, uh, Gabe's baby. He, he thought of it. And he recruited a lot of, uh, of people uh, that you've uh, heard of in the field. Um, and, uh, and he said, oh, by the way, you're starting the New York chapter. With Gabe, you didn't have any choice. You, you did what he said. And it was uh, there that uh, we started uh, NSDI. Uh, I ended up... Uh, serving a short term as vice president and later found out I was president and uh, went on to try to expand uh, what NSBI uh, later become International Society for Performance Improvement uh, would do. Marvelous. Marvelous. Uh, that, that's a mar marvelous uh, uh, correct track, track of record. Uh, thank you, sir. So when did you uh, start to uh, decide that uh, you will focus on needs assessment? 
Well, that was interesting. Uh, I was uh, working at Boeing, at Douglas Aircraft in Long Beach, California, uh, followed by you know, Bob Corrigan, who's an unsung hero of our field, uh, asked me to do consulting for him. And one day we were sitting around eating fattening donuts. And uh, he said, um, you know, everybody's talking about needs. And we were talking and I said, we got it that uh, I started, came up with the concept that needs assessment is a gap in results, not as a gap in needs or solutions. And started working on that. Uh, later on, uh, Bob went to uh, uh, Chapman College, now Chapman University, got me there. We got the Experienced Teacher Fellowship Program where we taught uh, strategic planning to all the, uh, the counties in California and had a chance to develop the concept of uh, needs assessment and later to add that as a subset of strategic planning. And it, I guess it was during that time that I, well, I first did at, at, uh, at Martin Baltimore where I was working met earlier Tom Merline that I decided that the, that the human performance uh, area was, was what I wanted to do. Well, I, ultimately, well, I ultimately left uh, Douglas Aircraft uh, mm -hmm. because what I was developing, I was afraid was going to come proprietary and uh, went to uh, U.S. International University where uh, we probably had the best faculty in human behavior in the universe. Uh, there we had uh, seven past present and future presidents of the American Psychological Association, three wow. past uh, present or future president of the American Sociological Association, um, had uh, Theodore H. Blau, who had uh, started program instruction in his clinical uh, practice in uh, Tampa, Florida. Uh, he was a past president, George Alvey, um, the Ever uh, Rogers, uh, was a faculty member there until he stormed off as he always did. And uh, it, it was a rather remarkable faculty. Uh, the president ran us out of money. And then I accepted an invitation from Bob Morgan at Florida State University uh, to move from San Diego, which is probably the second uh, nicest climate in the world, uh, to Tallahassee, Florida. And there uh, worked with uh, Bob Morgan, which later helped create the Learning Systems Institute. Uh, Bob Branson was there. And oh, guess somebody by the name of Bob Gagne uh, uh, <laughs> was a faculty member there. And I got to talk to uh, interchange with, with Bob. Uh, Bob Branson, uh, who was the, actually, I think he invented the ISD model, except instead of evaluation, he talked about control, which I think is a better term uh, because after you evaluate what well, first you then you have to use it and so i think branson was really ahead of his time uh, by talking about uh, control he he that did that for the joint uh, military services which became the standard for military throughout the world and uh, one day i was thinking about this idea of, uh, we have to move our field from how do we do things to what should we do bob mager uh, was famously probably the most important person in defining measurable performance objectives uh, to why do we do it in the first place? I mean, we can teach people how to uh, make an in asbestos insulation factory successful, uh, but is that good for society? No, not really. And so I started pursuing the, the what question and I came up with the idea, um, I guess sitting around this same office, uh, in Tallahassee um, for the concept of, well, society is really what it's all about. If, as Dale Brethard <clears throat> later said, if you're not adding value to society, you're subtracting value. He said it, I didn't, I wish I did. Uh, by the way, Dale is one of the unsung heroes of our field, a, a genuine genius. He uh, is. And uh, so I, I, I wrote something up and tortured myself over it, and finally, I asked Bob Gagne to review it. Now, that was a big deal, you know. What Bob said would make, make or break at least my feelings about it. About two weeks later, I got a call from Bob. He said, Roger, yes, Bob Gagne here, as if you couldn't recognize his distinct voice. 
He said, I've read your, uh, your paper and I'm ready to talk. And I said, Bob, you want me to come over to your place? He said, no, I want to come to yours, which is bad news because you know, George, from your uh, industrial experience, when you want to fire somebody, you want to do it on their office so you can leave. And so he came over and after a couple of uh, cups of tea, didn't, didn't drink coffee, um, he said, uh, Roger, uh, I want to be very clear about what I'm saying. I, I, I don't want you to misunderstand me. And in my heart, I'm saying, oh, God, he didn't like it. And he said, uh, I, I, want to, I, I don't want you to misunderstand. And my heart kept sinking. And he said, uh, no, I don't mean to discount your other work, but this is probably the best thing you've ever done. And I said, wow. And with that encouragement, because Gagne, I mean, he was a giant among giants. And I kept developing it. it got a lot of resistance to it, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people, uh, big figures at, uh, at ISBI said it was a bridge too far. You know, nobody working down in the bowels of a factory can uh, uh, identify with, uh, you know, society. And mm -hmm. by the way, now with you know, things like uh, universal uh, um, pandemics, people who are working even as a delivery person now understand survival. And that's what Mega is about. Mega is about uh, survival, self-sufficiency, and then quality of life. And that's important to everybody in the world, regardless of their governments, regardless of their culture. At their core, everybody is interested in their survival and the survival of their families. And now I think we have a better understanding of what mega really means and how if you don't drive everything from there down, uh, you're gonna miss uh, the value of what you can add. So that's a, that's a brief history of Roger. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, that's, that's really, really, um, really impressive. And uh, I'm so glad that uh, uh, the young learning and development professional hear your interactions with Bob Bennett. And let me ask you, uh, how many years uh, you and Bob being colleagues at uh, FSU, uh, Florida State University? About five. Five he, years. Yes, he, he decided to retire uh, one last year to uh, work for the Air Force, and uh, and he left. Uh, uh, Bob took a shine to our, our son, Jack, and sent him scientific toys to play with and things like that. It, it, I, I mean, he was a nice man. And his wife was was terrific. They were they were a great couple. Uh, his daughter became a a professor, I think, at University of Georgia, but I'm not sure of okay. uh, of psychology. And um, the he he left quite quite a legacy. Uh, he really got into the science of learning, and 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 how people and why people learn. And at that time, it was a it was very important that he did that because it's, it gave us and started a scientific base for understanding about learning and mastery and what some people call fluidity now. Uh, and um, so th th those were very, very valuable times. I had some wonderful uh, colleagues at uh, Florida State, uh, Walt Dick, you know, in the Dick and Carey yeah. model. Uh, yeah. he, he was a faculty member. Uh, Bob Branson was. Uh, Bob Morgan, who actually is distinguished because uh, he and, and his team actually transformed the education system of South Korea. And, and they honor him. He gave him an honorary doctorate for that. And while he was still alive, every time he went to, to South Korea, he was, he was met with pomp and circumstances and, and fanfare, as he should have done. And the, uh, I think uh, the President, the dictator at that time was, I think, General Lee. Uh, Lee. Uh, he he gave Bob Morgan credit for South Korea's emergence as a first world nation because of the education system. Now that's stuff you won't hear in the literature, but uh, it's uh, it, it, it sure happened. It's history. It's truth, and it's fact. So I'm I'm so glad that you told us those uh, histories. And uh, uh, just, just just now, you mentioned uh, uh, very briefly that 
uh, Bob Branson, uh, Walter Dick, and those are also on our on my name list that I'm going to interview them and uh, later on because they're also masterminds in the field and they're all yes. very respected in these in this field. And I uh, just want to and, and you just mentioned. Oh, oh, oh by, by the way, George, they were also yeah. violently attacked uh, because people thought you know it was turning people into robots and that the. Uh, in the Dick and Carey model and the Branson model, you know, was dictatorial and imposed on people. And that was further from the truth. I think it was actually scaring the hell out of people to see that there might be better ways to do things and they might have to change. And so, you know, what you've seen it in, in your own work as you introduce, you know, important validated content, you get this pushback. You get pushback. Right. right. And, and uh, the... Uh, and, and I think uh, uh, their models, uh, of course, they, if they were still with us, they would have evolved over time. Uh, but uh, it, it set the platform for us. And we were doing a, a lot of stuff. My Center for Needs Assessment and Planning uh, was working with the, the State Department of Education, especially vocational adult and community education, and uh, the governor's office. Uh, and uh, we started leaving our footprint on the deep. Even even if you if they went away from it, it was a regime change. At least there were people there who understood the basic concepts of needs assessment as a gap in results, strategic, tactical, and operational planning as the three levels, uh, the the purposive design of learning opportunities. Uh, based upon what people really have to know and how to contribute and how to continuously and continually improve. And so even the regimes change, those things stayed with the people. Uh, I, I just got an interesting uh, letter, if I can go off on a personal thing. George. Sure. Last night from a student I had at U.S. International University in 1971 and 72 in San Diego. And basically, he said, thank you for changing my life. What I learned from you helped me becoming a professional to contribute. And he said he, he remembers two other faculty members there that he learned a lot from, and I did too. One was Harold Greenwald, uh, the author of a book called Direct Decision Therapy, which I think if you want to understand psychotherapy in its basic terms. Mm -hmm. It is book, Direct Decision Therapy. It's out of print. But every once or twice a year, I pull it out and just get a refresher course for you. And he and Albert Ellis and I uh, ran workshops on psychotherapy and strategic planning because purpose is so important. And speaking of, of purpose, another member of that faculty was Victor Frankl. Uh, man search for meaning, and uh, Victor uh, became a friend and a, and a mentor. And I, it, it's nice when you, as you know, as you work in an environment where you have colleagues that you can learn from each other, and you get a synergy, which 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 is wonderful. Uh, anyway, I'll shut up. What's your next question? No, uh, I, I mean that's a great, great point that you hit. Uh, you, 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 you hit there, uh, Doctor um, uh, Victor Frankl. Uh, I believe he's an Austrian, and he did a marvelous job. Who set uh, the foundation for local therapy? I don't know what what does it translate into in Mandarin. I don't know yet. Okay, I'm learning. <laughs> I, I'm surprised. I'm surprised that you know about him. Very few people know about him. Yeah. Also. Uh, uh, read up on Harold Greenwald. Uh, it'll help you understand your behavior and motivations mm -hmm. and that of others. It's, uh, it, 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 it's really a brilliant work. By the way, Harold Greenwald uh, was the only person who had his doctoral dissertation made into a movie. Really? Yes. Uh, he a real movie? The like the movie theater movie? He, he, he got his uh, PhD in psychology at Columbia University, and he studied uh -huh. prostitution. Oh. And uh, it was made into a, a movie, I think, uh, Ladies of the Night or something, based upon his research. 
Uh, wow. He, he started off as a, a kid from New York. He was a Catskill comedian, stand-up comedian. And he said he was about um, 40 years old, and he was there as a comedian. And he said, I don't like what I'm doing. Why am I spending my whole life made by a decision by a 20-year-old kid who didn't know anything? There he got the idea of decision as so important mm -hmm. and purpose as so important. And he decided to go back and get his degree. And uh, I was fortunate enough to have him and his cop uh, as a friend and a colleague. And his wife, uh, Ruth, was a doctoral student. And she was really bright, too. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm droning on. I'm sorry. No, uh, yeah, no, that's a, that's a great story to hear. Uh, what, 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 what year? I mean, in, like in the 70s or 80s or 90s? What, 70s. What, the 70s, 70s movies, 90s. okay. It, it, it is not a documentary, right? But it's a real movie, and I'm gonna look it up later. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's that's marvelous. I mean, your PhD d dissertation can be turned into a movie, and yes. that's something. <laughs> my, my my PhD dissertation, by the uh -huh. way, was was not believed by the United States Air Force, and they tried to get a rep. They tried to prove it wrong. They spent millions of dollars and found out I was right. But you know what? I I think. Open discourse is so important. It's just when we shut off alternate points of view and right. investigation and inquiry that we get into trouble. Oh, what, what I found out is also uh, almost a regularity. I mean, it's so so such a common phenomenon that when, when something uh, that reflects what nature is or the social societal regularity is, something good, basically fundamentally good, when they come out, they always get kickbacks. They always get oppositions. They all guess. Uh, they always get objections. Well, later on, and people spend millions and millions of dollars and prove, oh, it is right, just like your dissertation, like yep. like your point of view. And then what they can do is just you know spend a hundred dollar and just you might over lunch and say, hey, Roger, you're right. And then they say, well, hundred million dollars, a couple million yeah, dollars, yeah. right? Yeah, as as the famous why the as the famous U.S. Negro spiritual saying, we shall overcome. We shall overcome. I know that one. It's uh, especially in the plantation, the uh, Southern period, we shall overcome, right. And also uh, just a smaller point that uh, uh, earlier you mentioned, Bob Branson, that he, uh, he, in he is an inventor of the ADDIE model, but Right now, we know it as ADDIE, but when he invented it, it's ADDIC. And you said very quickly that you think the IC should be ADDIE. I mean, and why yes. Why did it change to ADDIE? Somebody got a hold of it and wanted to put their stamp on it, so they modified it. By the way, uh, Ingrid Gellar Lopez, uh, when yes. she was uh, in, in her doctoral uh, dissertation under me, she managed to survive that. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we talked, and she added another A onto the Addy model, which was assessment. Okay. So it, it gives you uh, front end direction. Because if you start with analysis, it's too late. You've already decided what to analyze, and it's worth analyzing. But what about value and purpose? And so uh, the, uh, in her uh, dissertation, she added uh, another A for assessment. So it hasn't, uh, become pop it hasn't become popular, but it should. Yeah. So, so in your word, that uh, you you just said the traditional, the classic ADDIE model used to be ADDIC, and then somebody else changed it to ADDIE. But and also yes. one of your doctoral students, also your co-author of your one of the books, that Ingrid, uh, she had the model for ADDIE uh, modification is A A D D I E. A double right. A in the front. What the first right. A is needs assessment, and then well, well actually assessment, that, which is the major tool, is needs assessment. Is, uh, t tell us something about the needs assessment that you you just explained a little. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Sure. Do you have a few years? Yeah. Oh, I have like uh, thirty minutes. <laughs> um, well, the word need got co-opted by. Abraham Maslow, when he talked about his hierarchy of needs. 
And before right. he died, he and I had a, a, an interesting conversation. And I said, Abe, you don't have a hierarchy of needs. He said, what? I said, you have a hierarchy of motivators because what you have is gaps at these various levels. What order you will attempt to close them? And he said, well, I have a lot invested in my model, but I understand what you're saying. So the, uh, the whole idea of need as a gap is so fundamental, George, because if you do that, you get three bonuses. If you have data to support the gap between what is and what should be, you have your objectives. You don't have to do a separate study. Number two, you have your evaluation model or control model because all you have to do is see how far you've come from what is to what you wanted to accomplish. The gap in yourself said, how far have you moved? And the third thing is how to never get a proposal turned down. Because if you write a proposal on the cost to meet the need, people say, we, we don't have that much money. But if you also say, what's the cost to ignore the need? And they turn it down, they become responsible for the negative results. And so we, I've just been developing that over, over the years, uh, refining it uh, as we go. And uh, the uh, now my, my latest thinking, and I think I sent you the, the article, is that needs assessment good, uh, and good planning should be outside of the organization in and use that to derive what an organization should use, produce, and deliver instead of the just the inside out where you start with what it where you are and try to move it towards mega. Now, once you've been successful at the outside in planning, then the inside plan becomes useful. And so that's that's where I am today. And uh, the, uh, my trouble is my as my body deteriorates, my head keeps working. You're fine. You look you look all very fine to all of us. Thank you, Roger. Um, so, so you just also mentioned that uh, the inside out and the outside in. See, it should be outside in instead of inside out approach for needs assessment. Uh, and uh, that comes even before any training needs analysis. And uh, yes. so, if I, so I just wonder, uh, explain to us needs assessment is part of your mega planning. Is, is that is that statement true? Yes. And after you've done the needs assessment. Then you want to find out where the needs, the gaps came from. And that's needs analysis. Then you can analyze the source and the reason for those gaps. So you can design a way to close the gaps. So first needs assessment, then needs analysis. So the needs assessment is more kind of at a macro level and no. at a organizational level, or sometimes even more, even larger at the societal level. Well, Is that I'd, right? I'd, I'd say at the mega level, societal mega level, level, right? Then right. macro and then micro, and then right. of course those levels, the three levels of results have to be aligned. Right, right. It goes up. It just goes up. So to all the learning and development professionals, especially young professionals in China, what are the practical application significance does it have? Well, it, it, it's very simple. If you don't want to design a failure. And most people, have you ever noticed how much, how many training programs get a lot of enthusiasm and never change anything? The data from Deming and Durant, the two gurus of, of quality management, although right. Deming didn't like the term total quality management, uh, that, that performance breakdowns happen usually not at the individual worker level where we train, but at the organizational level and the client external world. So no matter how well you fix it at the operational level, if the problem comes from the, the organization itself, and you've seen a lot of dysfunctional organizations, oh, or yeah. from, the, from the external world, you've wasted a lot of money. And so if you listen to Deming and Duran, if you start with a training needs assessment, you're going to be wrong 80 to 90 percent of the time. Yet we spend, as as you and I talked about before, right now in the United States, 
We're spending $83 billion a year on training. I think what we could do is if that training leaks up the value chain to, to uh, macro and meg. Uh, it's, it's not that I want to get rid of training. I just want it linked. I just want it, 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 the human performance and competency will add value within and then outside the organization. That's all I want. And right now, we, we uh, rely on hope. That's really insightful that uh, we should all work out at the uh, at the mega level and then exactly the macro, and then and then the mi micro level. So to all the learning development professionals, we really have to. I think I think your advice is very very good that uh, we should not design for failure. We should not design failure basically. Any of our right. training pro program should not be just a, a failure. Um, this is this is so important to all of the learning development professionals in China because nowadays China also spent humongous amount of money in training and development. I remember one conversation we had earlier that the United States spent 83 million uh, no excuse me 83 billion U.S. dollars annually on training development. But um, what's your uh, what's the ADD's uh, number? That how much? What's the percentage of of them are effective trainings? What's the percentage? I you know, I don't know. Probably the most powerful force is ATD. Yes. And uh, now they, they are starting to expand. In fact, I have an article of, about uh, outside in planning uh, coming on their their home page uh, later this month. They're starting to see that you have to expand. It's not no, it's yes and. Yes and. And so, uh, and, and, and I'm... And I'm not trying to denigrate training and human performance. I'm just saying to capture the power of people. And nothing happens without people. Nothing. Uh, make sure you have that alignment, that hierarchy of planning. And by the way, right. there's also hierarchy of needs assessment, which tracks that exactly. It's the same as uh, uh, Maslow's uh, uh, hierarchy of needs. And uh, I, I'm so glad that uh, you had that conversation with him. And uh, did that conversation continue i mean later on no unfor unfortunately uh, he passed away right and uh, he was a terrific guy and mm -hmm. and the concept of the hierarchy of motivators i think is very powerful because motivation purpose you know right. victor frankel's you know man's search for a meaning and a purpose uh, harold greenwald's direct decision therapy all of this mm -hmm. goes to purpose and, and if we don't get that right, you know, that's like getting up, flying an airplane and saying, hey, we're at 30,000 feet and we spent, just spent, set a speed record. Uh, uh, the only problem is we're lost. You know, if you don't know where you're going, as Bob Maker said in his famous uh, objective book, if you don't know where you're going, you might end up someplace else. Uh, Roger, I'm just pulling up uh showing our viewers this book one of your you have you have written like 30 40 books you have published like 400 articles in total For, 40 41 books 41 Thank books. You. that's that's the last one that i i wrote and about 320 articles thank you for the commercial <laughs> and this one is the uh this one um not a lot of pages but you co-author with ingrid and it's been translated into Chinese called the uh, uh, needs assessment. Uh, just for our viewers, I'm going to say it in Chinese in one sentence. Uh,请大家注意这个需求评估和需求分析是不一样的。需求评估在需求分析之前，具体的是怎么样？我们回来再谈，好吗？ So this is this is the only book probably that uh, of your 41 books been translated, and it seems like we have a lot of work to do in China. Yes. The, uh, I, 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 would, I wish others would because I, I think the future of our society is going to be in the hands of China and the United States. And I think if we, if we make it humanistic, if we make it all about people and their survival and quality of life, uh, anything we can do, you know, regardless of our 
of our nation, our religion, or anything, anything we can do to add value to all humanity, the better off we all are going to be. Absolutely. I, I always, uh, my, my own, one of my own uh, reflections that, uh, is that I always say in one sentence that um, um, uh, training is science and instruction is art. And people are so important and uh, we need to motivate people. We need to, we also need to find out the real business gaps are uh, where, because uh, that's where, you know, uh, organizations, they survive and they make profits to, to their, to their teams, to their investors, to, to their shareholders. And then, you know, the entire society keep going. So I think, I think you are absolutely right that we need to motivate people. We need to believe in science and no matter where where we are no matter what country we are science is science what is science science is if you don't believe it you dump it you kill it and then a century later somebody else did the experiment again it shows up again as the same thing yeah that's science. If, if, you, if you don't believe in science what do you believe in exactly <laughs> and and while we're at it no. can i thank you for the contribution you've made, contributions you've made to the field, uh, you're still a board member of ISBI, and and you've added value there, and and in your work uh, with uh, PIA 2.0, and uh, so thank you for your work and contribution. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your encouragement. Where uh, there's uh, still a lot of ahead of us, and we need to do. We're still the uh, strong horses there, and uh, there's such a big maiden land to be cultivated and the society needs to keep going. So we'll keep on going. So thank you for, in, for encouragement. Thank you, sir. Good. Next question, uh, Roger. Um, the ISD theory, the instructional system design theory uh, evolved from the United States, you know, in the 50s and gradually 60s and 70s. And then the ADI model came out. And of course it was, you used to be ADDIC model, but um, who do you think are the important figures? Are the are the formation of the ISD theory? Are you considering? Do you also consider yourself one of the important contributors of this uh, ISD theory? But yes, but yes, uh, I think there's other people who are much better at the at the instruction and learning design people than I am. I, I've done it. Uh, it's just like a. Uh, an internist saying, you know, they're specialists. And when I think somebody else can do this better than I can, I refer. So I, I refer, you know, the, the learning and instructing things to other people. Uh, I think the, the history of this uh, is long. Uh, in my uh, ISPI master's talk that I gave last week, I, I gave a list of people who were fundamental in our past history. And, and right. the list the, the list is three PowerPoint pages long, and uh, and there's there's a lot of a lot of people uh, that, uh, that don't get recognized. I like Bob Corrigan was one of the first people to actually do feedback while the instruction was taking place. Uh, his his monitor teletest, his first uh, system approach to education, the safe system, uh, which. Uh, Worked so well in Moss Point, uh, Mississippi, that when the superintendent left, the teachers union threw it out. I mean, they actually took kids, mostly minorities, who were failing. I mean, failing, and got them way above grade level. But it was so foreign to the teachers that they didn't know how to do it, so they had to get rid of it. But the but the concept endures. And so uh, uh, the, there's a lot of people in the instructional design that, uh, but maybe that's the, that's the topic for another day, George. Exactly. It is. It is. Yeah. I mean, I know that uh, you made a, uh, you made a keynote speech the other day at the ISPI online virtual conference opening. And uh, that was like two hours. And, uh, I'm unfortunately I missed that it was because it was at the middle of the night. <laughs> That's right. So but the, I, since, I will make up since since when is the middle of the night bothered you? <laughs> I always work in American hours, right? I try not to. <laughs> to 
take some time for George and your wonderful family. Thank you, thank you. I will, I will, I will. And uh, next question is um, uh, just a, a little bit of history, sir. Um, so when 1962, you mentioned a little bit, and then you set up a New York chapter of I NSPI at that time. Now today is ISPI, the International Society for Performance Improvement. So tell yes. us something about that. And in 1962, when it was founded, you were already a member. And then in 1963, if I remember, you were the vice president. And later on, you became the secretary. And later on, you became president. How many times you become president? And something like that. So just once, just once was enough punishment. <laughs> uh, the um, when when my board took over, we found out the membership was ninety nine people, ninety nine people, and we okay. spent that entire year uh, proving value for money, and uh, we got it up to a thousand. And by the way, every member of uh, uh, my board ultimately became president. Which is interesting. Now I think the qualifications for president shifted from people who in the field who are contributing and building to uh, implementers and people who are popular. Uh, the, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping uh, now that Nancy Burns is president that, uh, that you're going to help her steer it, steer the, the court back, uh, ISPI back, because it's a very, very important organization. It is. It so is. thank you for uh, what you're doing. Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. We're uh, currently our board member are working as a team very closely together. So we'll carry on. No problem. The 1962 ISPI was formed. Uh, why was it formed? What the, ori what the original you know, reason for Gabe, it? Gabe Olfeich, the founder, tells this story. He was an instructor at the Air Force Academy in Boulder, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And somebody came into his office to sell him on teaching machines. And Gabe said he got furious and threw him out and said this was absolutely opposite to everything education and training should be. And then he thought about it. And then he became uh, head of training at Shepherd Air Force Base. And he started with an inquiring mind thing. You know, there's got to be a better way that and somebody just sitting on a stage droning on. And he started looking into the field and he invited uh, some of the early people who were working on it. Fortunately, you know, I was at the first ISBI, NSBI conference in, in Texas and uh, we, we had some very, very interesting people there. And together he, we formed a team that helped him get Air Force training started. And, and and get an SPI launched, but it was because Gabe threw out a, a, a teaching machine person and then thought about it. The, uh, what what Gabe did for our field is cannot be overlooked, and we do, and we do. Was he also the first president of uh, an SPI SPI at that time? He, yes, I mean, yes, he was yes. right. I remember. Yes. And uh, I also read a little bit of his history of NSPI, NISPI when it was uh, it was in Austin, Texas, was it? No, not in Austin. Um, San Antonio. Oh, San Antonio. By the way, by the way we've been trying, uh, Roger Addison and I, for about four years now, to get on the ISPI site, the complete list of officers, uh, the people who put together your, uh, your website, who I think they owe you money. Uh, just chopped it off at the year 2000. And we can't get ISBI to put the full list up again. So maybe you can help do that. I, I will, I will I'll talk to the board. I'll report to the board and uh, try to get it back. I have the name list. I have the name list uh, back to the very uh, starting year in 1962, all the officers. And I remember five officers and later on and then later on and on. And uh, it's a huge list because there's 60, well, 50, 58 years now, I think. Yeah, Bob, Bob Mager was the president. Gary Rumler was the president. Uh, the, Dale Barthauer. 
everybody yeah. all the big names all the big names that we read from the books we uh sometimes if you're lucky enough to watch on the videos on youtube and but most of them we read from our textbooks they're all the presidents of ipi so very very uh indeed very prestigious organization and what a courageous thing that and, and, and they were did. creators they were creators they built building blocks upon which right. we, we all developed um uh, another question, sir. We're we're getting close to uh, our interview, but I don't want to. But I do have a few uh, little questions to to hit on. That is that um, you have been in this field for over sixty years. Uh, 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 for over sixty years, am I correct? Unfortunately, and, uh, yes. <laughs> and that's that's our target. We're we're going to pass you. Some of ours will pass you. I mean, in that uh, 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 devo uh, devotion to the field. Uh, in the future. So uh, you have been in this field for long enough that you have seen a lot of a series of world events, you know, oil crisis and, you know, changes in countries and this and that and human rights and uh, the different regional wars and something like that. So you have seen a lot. So the current pandemic, you know, after all those world events after that, did you see any changes to the learning development industry? And what do you see? What do you predict that this current pandemic will have some? What what kind of impact will this current pandemic have a yeah. uh, cost on our learning development industry uh, in the United States, in the United States, or or globally? Either way. Well, the first thing, uh, our field in the world, we've got to take the politics out. Uh, of we course, have to, we have to stop fixing the blame and start fixing the problem. Yes. And we're good at that. Our field is very good at that. Uh, yes. we're, we're, we're good at, at fixing the problem because the pandemic, for instance, uh, uh, I don't know, the United States is just starting to emerge from, you know, from complete lockdown. Uh, and uh, for instance, distance learning has become an absolute vital tool. Conferencing right. like this has become a vital tool. It used to be that, you know, uh, we had to fly hours and hours and hours and sit around a conference table and talk. And and now, you know, uh, except that I can't join you for dim sum, we're getting th the same kinds of things done. And so you can, you can. I'll fly over to Tallahassee and then we'll go to dim sum for sure. On me, it's good. on me. <laughs> the I'll do that. The, uh, but I think what's happening is the thing that we know how to do are be going to become increasingly important. And I think if, if we can just put commercialization and profit a second, not to be ignored, but societal value added first, then we'll get this thing right. And, and, and the whole world can uh, uh, benefit. Schumpeter, the 1927's uh, economist, talked about creative destruction. He said, sometimes you have to dis destroy the past to build the future. And I think if we're smart, we can do that now. We could get rid of a lot of these vestigial organs. Uh, you know, does everybody have to come to work at the same time at the same place? And the answer is probably no. Uh, you know, uh, do we have to have, uh, you know, huge conference rooms? Uh, probably no. Do we have to have large sporting events? Yes. <laughs> I like large sporting events, uh, but but I think that the future for us is bright if we will actually work together uh, to collectively add value to each other and society, and we know how to do it. Don Toasty, who is also a former president, said that what our technology is scalable, you know, from process to micro to macro to mega let's scale what we do what we know how to do and uh, i think uh, with every tragedy comes opportunity and you were telling me that the the, the chinese symbol for what for fear is what oh 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 crisis for crisis Cri crisis, crisis in uh yeah cri the word crisis in chinese 
is composed of two words, actually. One is way meaning crisis. The other is ji meaning opportunity. So every crisis is actually uh, both a crisis and opportunity combined. I thought it was fear plus opportunity. No, it's then, crisis. Okay. Way, I, ji, yeah. I thought crisis was fear plus opportunity. Anyway, uh, yeah, but let, me teach you, let me teach you some more Chinese. Um, I don't know what I'm talking about. But but anyway, you know, that, that goes back to the cultural heritage and wisdom of, of the Chinese culture. It does. I mean, so much so much stuff and, and, and concepts have, have come out of China. And, I, and I'd love to see that uh, continue. And uh, so I think the future is bright if we build on it. And I think one of the things we could do is go to our government and go to our businesses and say, look, nothing is ever going to be the same again. Let's learn from this on how we can make things not only cheaper, faster, better, but also useful. And so I think we can become entrepreneurs and do that. I just introduced that concept to our mayor. And he says, I love the idea. He's going to take it up with the management and see if he can't get some of the really bright people here to say, look, how can we do things differently now? And so maybe I think there's opportunity. You mean the it's, mayor of Tallahassee, right? Yes. Yeah. Beautiful city. I've never been there yet, but I, I have an appointment for uh, for do some someday <laughs> in the near future. You have you you have the invitation in Spanish. Uh, Casa Kaufman is open. Our home is is your home. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, second to the uh, second last question is that uh, you you have been uh, also regarded as uh, one of the legends in the field. Um, looking back over your long years of history uh, in uh, in the uh, in this field, what if you could do it again professionally? What or how would you do it differently? That's a good in question, way. George. Next question. Uh, <laughs> what will they do it differently? Um, if you had an opportunity, if you go back, we travel in a, by a time machine. Like, yeah, I'd, I'd spend less time fighting the opposition and more time creating, keeping on creating. Spend a lot of energy, you know, de dealing with the resistance. Uh, the... Um, I don't know. I had to evolve as a person. My thinking had to evolve with experience. Uh, my secret weapon is my wife, who uh -huh. uh, her father warned me before we uh -huh. were married. Said, "Don't ask Janice a question you don't want an honest answer to." And <laughs> she she has always done that. So she's sort of in the wind under my wings. Uh, the um, I met her and married her too late, but. She, she's helped me. Um, By the way, you two have married for over like 50, 60 years, over? 56 years, yeah. 56 years. Oh, uh, four years to go for diamond marriage. Yes, right. So, oh, I expect a lavish gift, George. You got it. The, uh, it's on, it'll be on the way. The, uh, the, 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 other, the other thing is I would, uh, early on, I had a friend of mine who was a fundamentalist Christian minister. And I used to anguish over, you know, all the, all the uh, attacks I got. And he said, Roger, your enemies will never be convinced. Your friends don't have to be. Just go ahead and do what's right. And I should have taken his advice earlier. Now that doesn't mean I've always been right. You know, I've made some mistakes, uh, but uh, you know, every, Every mistake is a friend in disguise. It lets you know what to change if you're open to it. And so I think I would have been good to take his, his advice. Sir, can you repeat that sentence? Your enemies will never be convinced and your friend... Don't have to be. Don't have to be. Just do, go ahead and do what you got to do, right? Something like that. Yep. Yep. And paraphrase. And do what's right. And do what's right. That's right. Thank you. That's... That's really uh, something to a uh, very lifelong good advice to all of our viewers uh, in front of the camera. 
in front of the That was given to me or, by, by a fellow by the name of J.C. Fikes. And again, it's one of those things that uh, I wish I'd said, but I didn't. But I've had the opportunity to learn from a whole array of people. And, and he was one of them. Thank you so much, Roger. This is just great, great advice to all of us, especially we're still, uh, some of us are really just started your career or in the middle of a career or getting close to retirement. So wherever we are, I mean, that's very good advice to, I think, everybody. Um, also, uh, this time is a real second to the last question. You know Peter Drecker, and Peter Drecker is known as one of the great masterminds of uh, uh, measurement. And uh, you have some interactions. Do you know him personally also? I, Can you tell us no, about no, I've interacted with him. Okay. And I've interacted with Francis Hesselbein, who is the uh, director of the Peter F. Drucker Foundation. And after Peter died, for some reason, he, they didn't want his name used on anything. Hmm. So she had to, had to rename it to the Francis Hesselbein. One of my... Uh, Valued artifacts as I wrote a book on mega planning, and he wrote me a handwritten note congratulating me on it. Uh, uh, Peter Drucker is a once in a millennia a kind of brilliant, brilliant person. Uh, one of his great things, and somebody said, by a fellow named Freddie Kay said the same thing, uh, is if you can't predict the future, create it. Uh, it's like uh, Gandhi saying, be, be the change you want to create. Um, and I'm sure there was some uh, Chinese philosopher that said it before everybody else. But uh, again, Drucker is, is just a giant, just a giant. And um, I, I interacted uh, with him from a distance, uh, took advantage of it, and... Um, and his teachings. Thank you, sir. Uh, last question, close, as a closing comment, we're getting close to our interview. Uh, as a closing uh, statement or comment, any advice, do you have any advice to the young uh, Chinese learning development professionals? Mm. Well, that catches me on a bit. I'd Anything. say several things. Number one, be authentic. Be you. Uh, think for yourself. Learn from others. Have great purpose and have a passion for what you're doing. You're going to run into obstacles. You're going to run into naysayers. You're going to run into people who don't want you to succeed. Prove them wrong. Success is the greatest revenge. And just go ahead, and I say, of course, I would say the most important thing is have a passion for mega, have a passion for adding value to measurable value to our shared society. And if you do those things, uh, you're going to be successful and you're going to add value to all of us. And, and that's what we want to do. We want to uh, leave this world with a positive footprint, leave something behind where you made, even in a little way, the world better. For everyone else, and I'd say just just have that passion. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, Roger. Uh, Bukachi. 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 George, Bukachi. Th thank you for inviting me, and I hope some of this would be uh, useful. Uh, it is. It is very valuable to all of us, and uh, on behalf of uh, all of our viewers, thank you again, Roger, and. Uh, we all wish you well, and um, just like uh, one of the uh, great um, uh, anchors in America, uh, Garrison Keillor says, do good work, be well, and stay in touch. Say Jin. Say Jin. <laughs>